Thank you very much. Let me start by introducing you to somebody who I find really fascinating, a gentleman by the name of Rodney Brooks. Mr. Brooks was a uh, entrepreneur, a roboticist. In fact, he was one of the, the founders of iRobotics. You may have heard of that. He was also a director of the MIT Artificial Intelligence Lab and did similar work in the area of AI during the 1980s and the 1990s. He said of artificial intelligence in his 1991 paper, a reasonable characterization of the general field is that it is intended to make computers do things that when done by people could be characterized as having indicated intelligence. We're seeing the emergence of a new kind of computing, something that we call cognitive computing, sometimes also referred to others as AI or artificial intelligence. Movies depict AIs as being either healthful or humorous, soulful, sometimes even malevolent. Many of these movies are merely exercises in getting us to think about our own selves in a different way. I'm here to suggest to you that cognitive computing is really about all of these and none of these. That cognitive computing is really about getting us to extend our own human cognitive reach. It's not about being better than humans. It's about making humans better. In 1947, at the Center of Advanced Studies, Jonathan Van Neumann began work on what has become the blueprint for all modern computing architectures. The Van Neumann architecture is at the heart of virtually every computer that we use, whether those are the largest mainframes, or the most common server or laptop computers, or every one of our smartphones. Clara, his wife, said of Johnny, he wanted to create a fast, electronic, completely automatic, all-purpose computing machine that could answer as many questions as there are people who could think of asking them. Even then, 70 years ago, engineers imagined that computers would possess artificial intelligence. The problem is that von Neumann was a mathematician. He viewed the world in terms of mathematical models. If you can create a model that describes the thing you're working on, then you can use it to answer questions about that thing. Consequently, he created a computer that processes mathematical models. That's what a software program is. It's the symbolic representation of mathematical logic. The problem is that the world as we actually experience it is very hard to model mathematically. Sure, the underlying science of physics and chemistry and biology are subject to the rules of mathematical regularity, but that's not what we actually experience. It's hard to model our language, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our motivations with clinical precision. We're complex beings with complex relationships to the world around us. We're subjected to far too many conditions to expect to ever be able to create and capture all the rules that govern that experience. Even if we could capture the millions of rules that represent the things that we see and hear and feel and taste and smell, or the conditions that define how we go about creating a new thought or expressing an idea, by the time we got done writing down all those rules, they would change. We'd learn something new that would change our understanding of those conditions. We could never maintain such a model. No, to create a an artificially intelligent computer requires a fundamentally different approach. In fact, to capture something that is able to reason about the world exactly the way that we do, in essence, would require that we replicate the human mind in all of its finest details. Can we do that? Maybe. But what's the point of that? We have 7.4 billion human minds in the world now and frankly, much more fun and interesting ways of creating more of them. <laughs> what economic value could possibly ever come from capturing and replicating the human mind in a machine? Instead, we should be embracing the differences between man and machine. On the other hand, there is value in thinking about AI in the same way we have every other tool that humans have created for the last 10,000 years. That is 
as an extension to our own human strength. In the same way that pulleys and levers and hammers and shovels and hydraulics amplify our human muscle, augmented intelligence can amplify our mental muscle. There's a lot of things that the human mind does well. Recognizing faces in a crowd, communicating ideas, feeling, imagining, solving hard problems. But we also have our limitations. There's only so much that we can read. There's only so much of that that we can assimilate. There's only so much of that that we can remember, and there's only so much of that that we can recall under pressure. Augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence, can help us with all of that. You know, the Watson for Jeopardy machine could read 200 million pages of literature to find answers to complex factoid questions in less than three seconds. Questions that were deliberately full of subtlety and innuendo and puns and misdirection. Cognitive computing can help us see alternatives that we might not find on our own. It can help us see through our biases to other points of view that might otherwise elude us. It can inspire us to new ideas. Cognitive computing can help us get back to doing what we do really well, that is, thinking. You know, one time I asked Watson, who was the first black president? Of course, I expect him to answer Barack Obama. To my surprise, Watson's top choice was Bill Clinton. <laughs> when I asked why, I found out that President Clinton was considered to be the first candidate to campaign specifically in support of representing underrepresented minorities. His cabinet was filled with highly skilled and diverse leaders. And Toni Morrison referred to him as the first black president in 1998 in recognition of his support for minority concerns. By the way, Watson's second choice was Nelson Mandela. <laughs> Notice I didn't say anything about which country. And finally, Barack Obama was third. But this illustrates how a cognitive computer can alter our perspective. You know, it's worth noting that our own intelligence is really two things our ability to reason intellectually, and our ability to express the results of that reasoning. You know, we can have internal intelligence, reasoning about the hardest problems in the world, perhaps even better than anybody else, in our own mind. But if we don't have the ability to express the results of that cogitation, then so what? No one will ever know us to be any more intelligent than a doorstop. This is the same with cognitive computing. For it to amplify our own cognition, the AI system needs to be able to understand us in our world. It needs to be able to reason about problems in a way that are relevant to our own conclusions. It needs to be able to learn without being programmed. And it needs to be able to interact with us in a way that informs and inspires us to better decisions. Just as importantly, for it to influence our creativity, the AI system has to have a sort of presence with us. That is, it has to have sort of a cognitive experience, something that enables us to recognize its own form of intelligence with the richness and the nuance of human communication. Keep in mind that our own cognitive expression is not confined just to words. We vocalize those words. We use intonation and cadence and inflection and timbre to punctuate those words to draw attention to the importance that certain words have over others. We also use body language, facial expression, eye contact, arm and hand gestures, body movement, all to convey and reinforce the meaning of what we're saying. Watson has the ability to determine our personality and our emotional tone and uses this to alter its conversational direction with us. Actually, we all have this ability, even if we do it subconsciously. There's a subtle and important difference between somebody who is angry and somebody who is disgusted. They're both negative, but somebody who's angry is also irrational. You can't just reason with them logically. You have to sympathize with them first. Somebody that is disgusted, maybe they don't like you, but they've rationalized that. They know why they're disgusted. We recognize this intuitively and we act accordingly. All of these things are essential to our experience, and they're essential for a cognitive system
to have a full impact on us, to amplify our cognition. We are entering a new era, an era that will be defined by how much more we are informed, by how deeply we reason, by how many new significant ideas we're able to create, and by how well we're able to overcome our most important and complex problems, all of which is going to be made possible by this new tool that we call cognitive computing. Thank you.